as dental anatomy. This is something we all very well know about. These are the notations. In that we have these universal system notation, wherein we write simple 1 to 8, then 9, 10, 11. We continue as 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And then we continue on the other side here. Yes. Then when we talk about Zygmondi or Palmer's notation here in primary teeth, they are dedicated by ABCs, while permanent teeth they are dedicated by 1 to 8 in each quadrant. And here whenever we write, we have to draw this quadrant and then we can write a particular number to specify a tooth. Then we talk about the FDI system notation. In the FDI system notation, uh, the first number indicates a quadrant. So here if you have 1, that would indicate a quadrant and here it has to be 2, 1. Here the number 1's, the first number indicates the quadrant while the next following number indicates a number of the two. So if you have 1, 4, that means in the first quadrant, fourth tooth, that will make maxillary first premolar. When we talk about the primary teeth, uh, number 5, 6, 7 and 8 indicate the quadrants in the primary teeth. And again we have 1, 2, 3, 4 indicating the number of the teeth here. We have some terms to understand. They're very simple terms. Then we have monophyodon. Monophyodon, the word means there is only one set of dentition for entire life. So once the tooth erupts, it does not shed. It is supposed to remain in the mouth throughout life. That is monophyodon. Then we have diphyodon. That is wherein we have two sets of dentition. One being the primary and then we have the secondary set of that is typical of human beings. We have the primary teeth, then we have the permanent teeth. So we have two sets of dentition. Then we have polyphyodon. Polyphyodon that indicates presence of more than two sets of dentition, typically seen in rodents, rats. Wherein one teeth shed, another set comes, then that sheds, then the next set comes, and so on and so forth. Then we have homodon. If you see these prefixes, they are very indicative of the meaning of the term. We have homodon. Homo means same. And here in all the teeth they have same shape. So you do not have incisors, canines or something. They all have same shape. But when we talk about heterodont, there is presence of different groups of teeth. Uh, example in humans. We have incisors, canines, premolars and molars. So they are all different groups of teeth. So now if we see we are diphyodon, that is we have two sets of dentition and we are heterodon, that is we have different shapes in our dentition, different groups of teeth in our dentition. Then we have bunodon. Bunodon is a term for primitive type of teeth which is seen in primates, cats, dogs, etc. They have very simple conical cusps, although they do have cusps, but they are simple conical cusps. Then we have haplodon which is seen in reptiles like crocodiles. These are simple cone teeth. See, this is conical cusp. So it is like you have cusp, but all these cusps are conical this way. But when we talk about the reptiles, they have a simple cone-shaped tooth and a simple root to that. If you talk about jaws of the crocodiles, we have always been comparing human jaws evolution from the crocodiles' jaws. Crocodiles here, they have a simple hinge-like movement. They do not have complex movement as we have in our TNG. Then we have triconodont. They are seen in early mammals. They, uh, these mammals, they have typical three cusp arrangement, wherein largest cusp is in the center and then we have these. So these cusps, presence of these conical cusps make it bunodont. But if we have three cusps, Three conical cusps, which will become triconodont or bunodont. Then we have tritubercular stage, wherein they were, there are three cusps, but these three cusps are not, you know, arranged in line. They are arranged, if you see from the occlusion, they are arranged in triangle. You have one cusp, two cusps, and three cusps. Then we have quadritubercular stage, wherein you have four cusps. So, it's you can say, we humans again, we in many of the teeth, we have four cusps. Then we talk about the first, in that we have first tooth to erupt in the oral cavity. We have the first primary tooth, the central incisors, while the first permanent tooth, we have the first molars. When we say first succedaneous tooth, be very careful about these terms. You know, first tooth, first tooth, first tooth, but first succedaneous tooth, mandibular, central incisor. We are talking about the mandibular permanent central incisor. Because 
mandibular first molar although this is the first permanent tooth to erupt but it does not have a predecessor but the first tooth which has a preceding primary tooth is your mandibular center incisor so you have primary tooth following that you have mandibular central incisors so it is the first tooth that is succedaneous to this tooth but when we talk about the first molars they do not have any primary tooth above them the initial calcification of primary teeth it starts for in fourth month in utero you may have figures like 13 weeks 13 to 15 weeks please do not get confused that means same as fourth month Initial calcification of permanent teeth, it starts in first molar and at birth, the calcification of first molar has already begun. There's one very common question asked about this uh, calcification part here. And if we take a radiograph at birth, typically how many teeth will we see on the radiograph? So the answer that comes to our mind is about the primary teeth. We have 20 primary teeth that can be seen. But yes, we have the first molars that have started calcifying. So we have 20 plus 4 that makes it 24 teeth. We can see on the radiographs and this is a very important thing. Then we have one more point here. Primary teeth, they start erupting at around 6 months of age. And by the age of 2 to 2 and a half, all the primary teeth have erupted in the oral cavity. In the root formation, it is completed by 3 to 4. If you see this, it's around 1 to 1 and a half year after the eruption. Now, if you know the eruption age of a particular tooth, you can very well calculate its root completion age. For a primary tooth, you have to just add 1 to 1 and a half year and you'll get the range. And for a permanent teeth, you have to add three, 2 to 3 years after the eruption age. We do have MCQ on this. Then the sequence of eruption. Most of the things in DA are kind of memory based but they are not so difficult to remember. So in deciduous teeth, very simple sequence. It's A, B, B, C, E. Only D comes before C. Rest of the sequence is same. And you have to remember the ages of eruption. Then when we talk about the permanent teeth. In permanent teeth, in mandible, it's 6. The first tooth to erupt is the permanent molar. Then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 6 is missing because it has already erupted. Then we have 7 and 8. So simple. 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 6 is missing. 7 and 8. So mandible sequence is as simple. Only you have to remove the 6. When you talk about the maxilla, how it goes? 6. Again, the first molar have erupted. Then we have 1, 2. But problem is the canine is lazy fellow here. Canine is shifted backwards. So here it shifts back behind 1, 2. So you have 4. Then it comes back 5, 7, 8. Canine, if it is really lazy, it can shift 2 teeth backwards. So you may have one more sequence. That is 6 is already erupted. 1, 2, canine has gone back. 4, 5, it's gone behind 2 teeth. It's come here. And then you have 7 and 8. So I don't think so. it's as difficult to remember these sequences and they are very important sequences and beware. You know, it's not that you make mistake in these MCQs because you don't know them. You make mistakes because you are careless. Please read the questions carefully. Please, please read the sequence carefully when you ask answer such questions. Now as we see the sequence of eruption of mandibular and maxillary, there's one more rule, a very typical rule that is the mandibular teeth, they erupt before the maxillary teeth erupts. And this tendency, this tendency, it is reversed in premolar eruption. So in all the teeth, be it incisors, molars, your mandibular incisor will erupt before the maxillary incisor. Your mandibular molar will erupt before the maxillary molar. But when we talk about a premolar, it's a maxillary premolar that erupts before your mandibular premolars. Why is it so? This is, this will be clear in our next diagram here. What we see here is the sequence of eruption in both the jaws that is maxillary and mandibular. We see here this is the first tooth to erupt first being mandible then we have the maxillary then we have the mandibular incisor then we will have the maxillary incisor then again an incisor and maxillary incisor then we have mandibular canine and here next we should have 
and silly canine but this lazy canine goes because the lazy canine is not erupting our premolars they start erupting while this mandibular premolar is still waiting for canine to erupt so this gets delayed so we have the maxillary premolar erupts first then we have the mandibular premolars so this is where the sequence changes so here only in premolars maxillary premolars erupt before the mandibular premolars there's one more point when there, whenever there is an eruption, what happens here is if you measure the arch perimeter of deciduous and permanent dentition, if you measure it on mesial surface of mandibular first premolar, that is from here forwards, the arch perimeter decreases by about 4 mm. If you don't imagine this location from where we are measuring the arch perimeter this sentence sounds a little tricky and you do have an mcq that arch perimeter of permanent dentition as compared to the deciduous dentition increases decreases remains same etc in that case yes it decreases by four millimeters and where we are counting from is the mesial surface of the first molar Next, we'll be talking about some surface markings. In that, we'll be talking about the cusp. Cusps are nothing but the elevations or mounds on the crown that divide the crown into the divisional parts. So these are the anatomic divisions of the crown. When we talk about mammalons, these mammalons are seen on newly erupted incisors and they represent lobes. They represent the developmental lobes. These mammalons, they are later worn out. So these mammalons are not seen in primary dentition. It's only seen in permanent. Then we have tubercle. Tubercle is something that is deviation from normal that is deposition of a small extra enamel on the surface of the tooth that would be tubercle. Then we have cingulum. Cingulum is a lobe that is seen on the lingual side of an anterior tooth. So this is your cingulum. Then we have ridge. Ridge is any linear elevation on the surface. This could be a marginal ridge we see a marginal ridge here these are the rounded borders of the enamel which are formed along the side so this is your distal marginal ridge and this is your mesial marginal ridge then we have triangular ridge these triangular ridge bits are the ridges that descend from the cusp tip here and they go down here so the, this is your triangular ridge it is called as triangular ridge because if you see this side of the slope and this side they are kind of making a triangle downwards these both slopes on both sides of the ridge these slopes on both sides of the ridge they make sides resemble a triangle because of which this is called as a triangle ridge next we have transverse ridge Tra what is transverse ridge any ridge that is here you have a buccal ridge and here you have a lingual ridge this total ridge will form your transverse ridge so buccal and a lingual triangular ridge is joined to form a transverse ridge then we have oblique ridge any ridge that would cross an occlusal surface obliquely will be your oblique ridge very typically seen in maxillary first molar then you have sulcus is depression or valley between the cusps and the ridges you see here in blue so these are your sulcus then we have developmental group. Then we have developmental group. Developmental groups they mark the division between the developmental parts. For example, we have this particular cusp as a developmental lobe. Then we have this. The distinction is your developmental group. Right? Then we have supplemental groups. The groups that extend from these developmental groups are your supplemental groups. Which at the junction of... Uh, these developmental groups these are the pits lobe as we had been talking about these are the primary section in the formation or the development of a tooth one more point about the mammalon is mammalons they represent the lobes from which a particular tooth develops and these mammalons they usually get abraded because of the contact with the opposite tooth except in the cases of malocclusion why we are discussing this here is because this is an important MCQ and this is very typically seen in class 2 division 1 malocclusion 
wherein the incisor they escape the incisal wear and these mammalons they persist even in later years we had discussed that calcification of primary teeth it begins in fourth month and here you have it in weeks it begins in 13 to 16 weeks and by 18 to 20 weeks post fertilization all the teeth they begin calcification and your permanent molars they begin calcification approximately at or near birth eruption in primary dentition we have already seen the sequence that was a b d c e that is d jumped here but when we compare this sequence in maxillary and mandibular what we have is your maxillary and mandibular anterior uh, incisors they nearly erupt at the same time with mandible preceding usually preceding so you can shift this a a little bit here then you have your maxillary lateral incisor that precedes your mandible then your d then d here then c then c here you can see everything in maxilla except a and e erupts first so all other teeth except a and e erupt first in maxilla your a that is your central incisor and e that is the second molar they erupt first in mandible this is one more important mcq point here root completion is about half done when the tooth erupts okay. there is a controversy in this half your wheeler says 50 percent or half that time while your mcdonald's some places say 75 percent or to be on the safer side we stick to 50 percent and if you have an option of marking 50 to 75 percent that would be the best possible option next we talk about the developmental lobes developmental lobes nothing are the divisions from which a tooth develops your primary incisor develops from one lobe primary second molar it develops from five lobes while your three cusp lower second premolar maxillary and mandibular permanent first molar they develop from five lobes this is very important mcq and all the other permanent teeth all molars incisors canine and premolars they develop from four lobes this diagram will give you a rough idea of the dentition stages so we start at six months by the eruption of first primary tooth then we continue till six years till six years it's you know at around two to two and a half your primary teeth all will erupt then up till six years will have no extra teeth erupting then at six years your first permanent mandibular for first molar erupts so we, with the eruption of this tooth your dentition is called mixed because herein you have primary and permanent bone then it continues at mixed as mixed dentition where an eruption shedding eruption shedding takes place at 12 years exfoliation of deciduous maxillary second molar maxillary second molar is the last tooth to exfoliate and following which we have no deciduous teeth left in our mouth so this is the stage of permanent dentition as we have been talking about anatomy we have one more point to be noted here we need to know what is line angle and what is point angle i'll just draw try to draw a cube over here if you take this cube, these are the surfaces of the cubes. This is the junction of two surfaces. This junction of two surfaces forms a line angle. While if we try to join three surfaces, if we just add up these three surfaces, where, where are these three surfaces contacting? We just mark it in blue. It is at this point they are contacting. So junction of three surfaces, combination of three surfaces form a point angle. Applying this theory to the teeth, we just count the line angles and the point angles of the teeth. So in anterior teeth, we have six line angles. So this is your anterior teeth. So these are your line angles. So if you can see, this is the labial surface and this is the distal surface. So this is your distal labial line angle. This is your distal lingual line angle. Then you have this. This is your labial surface and incisor. So this is labial incisor line angle. And this side is your lingual and incisor. Lingual incisor line angle. Then this is your mesial side. So this is mesial lingual. And this is your mesial labial. We, what we are not counting when we are counting the line angles. We are counting these four. I will just mark it in blue. We are counting this, this, this 
this and then we are counting the junction of labial with incisal and lingual with incisal we are not counting these two small line angles that is what your book says so it's not you know i tell you not to count these lines your book doesn't count these lines that is why we have six line angles in your anterior teeth when we start counting your point angles we count all of them we count this, we count this, I should draw it in red, we count this, this, this and this. So you have four point angles but six line angles. But when we go ahead with your posterior teeth, posterior teeth we count all of the line angles. So if you see here, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight line angles, I think so you can name them very well, I will not name them. And these four point angles. So these are your four point angles of the interiors and four point angles of the posteriors. Then we have point angles and line angles in the cavities. Number of line angles and point angles in the cavity. There are two ways. Either you can mark this up, but I would suggest not to do that. You can count them. So just to understand this, we'll first draw a tooth. So this is your tooth. This is the occlusal surface. And if I try to draw a cavity here, so this is your class 1 cavity. Now if we count the line angles and point angles, what we have here is 1, 2, 3 and 4, 4 point angles. And when we count the line angles, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 and vertical ones that is 5, 6, 7, 8 and we have 8 line angles. Now the question should come to your mind, why are we not counting these top line angles or these top point angles. We are not counting them because they are cavo surface line angles or point angles. So as a rule, we are not supposed to count cavo surface angles. Cavo surface means the angle that is formed between the cavity and the surface. Now if you try to convert this cavity into class 2, how it becomes? I will not draw the tooth this time. This is your class 2 cavity. This is the step and this is supposed to be rounded. So this is cavity, this is the step and this is the gingival part of the step. This is a class 2 cavity. If you start counting the point angles, what you have is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. And if you count the line angles, what you get is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. We are not counting this line angle, this point angle and this line angle and these point angles because here your surface continues. So this is your cable surface line angles and point angles. So that is how you get 6 and 11. With these two, I think, so you can go ahead with class 3 cavity wherein you have this triangular kind of cavity. You can just count it for the same. And you have class 4 cavity which is same as class 2. Class 5 is same as, you know, it's on the gingival surface but whole rest of the anatomy is same as class 1. In MOD, you have to add one more step on this side. So with these basic preliminary diagrams, you can just count the line angles and point angles for rest of the cavities and they are very common source of MCQ. Next we talk about the attachment of teeth to the jaw. Herein we have few more terms, acrodont. The term acrodont, so you have acrodont here and what you have is a tooth which is ankylosed to the bone. So this is your bone and your tooth is ankylosed here. We don't have a socket, it's just a tooth sitting on the bone. So this is acrodont. Then we have thecodont. Thecodont, herein we have the socket and this socket is very deep. There is no ankylosis. There are roots which are cylindrical. So normally what roots we have in humans are conical. But if you see the roots here are cylindrical. So this is typical of your thecodont. Then we have ankylosed thecodont. In ankylosed thecodont what happens? Yes, there is a socket but the tooth is ankylosed to the jaw. Now what is the difference from acrodont? In acrodont you had the tooth sitting on the top of it but here in the tooth is going inside the bone 
but yes still it is ankylosed so that is your ankylosed thecoderm so once you have a socket it becomes theco when it is ankylosed it becomes ankylosed thecoderm then we have one more subthecodont we'll, which we'll see in the next slide this subthecodont also called as pleuroacrodont or prothecodont what it has it has groove and a socket see now at this point what we need to know is what is a groove and what is a socket if you have a depression or a hole inside the bone this is your socket but if you have something like this that doesn't go deep inside this will be called as groove rather than a socket so in this case what we have is we have a socket you know part of it and we have a groove both so both a groove and shallow sockets are present and this groove if you talk about this groove it is high it is it has a high labial wall and a low lingual wall and there is also ankylosis present so this is your sub theco then you have the pleurodont in pleurodont or pleuroacrodont teeth they are ankylosed to the jaw but there is no socket if you can see it's just a groove and they are ankylosed to the groove then we have holacrodont here teeth are set in the groove but there is no ankylosis and with this we come to the end of this part please go through the text which we have covered till now and we'll have a short text on this